<laughs> I've seen some of these videos. I look kind of goofy when it comes on. Are we good? All right. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm glad you're here. And those of you who are watching online, we appreciate you tuning in. Be a part of our in-depth Bible study. We're going to be looking in the Psalms again tonight. There's a tremendous amount of doctrine and information and reflection of Christ all through these scriptures. And so it helps build our faith. And it is a book that most people don't realize, but Jesus Christ sang these psalms. And he read them, prayed these psalms. And then we see them reflected in his personal life. So it gives us a rich insight into who he was and is and how we can relate to him. So let's have a word of prayer and then we're going to get started. And this, of course, is our time of, of prayer meeting. And we're going to be praying for specific people as well who are either a part of our church family or connected with our church family. Well, Father, we thank you again for this evening. We do uh, appreciate so much the richness of your grace and mercy and kindness and tenderness in our lives. Father God, as we study your word tonight, we pray that you'll speak to us, that the words will become life in our lives and in, give us light to our path and help us, Father, to follow your will and do your will. And we ask it in Christ's holy name. Amen. <clears throat> hey, well, good evening, everyone. Glad to see y'all this afternoon. And we've all survived the rain, which we badly needed. But uh, take a hymn book turn to number 626. 626. The Lily of the Valley. I'm sorry, I didn't turn that for you. <laughs> all right. 626. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's a very subject thousand to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. He's a lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He all my griefs has taken and all my sorrows born. In temptation he's my strong and mighty time. I have all for him forsaken and all my idols gone. From my heart and now he keeps me by his power. Though all the world forsake me. give it a shot anyway. 343. <laughs> Amazing Oh, 
say this again that uh, if there's any hymn that you as a favorite of yours that we have not sang in a long time if you'll let me know uh we'll we'll sing it for you on a wednesday night uh please be glad to do that for you all right well first of all let me say thank you to everyone that was a part of providing food for uh the roberts family for miss vera hughes's family uh, very uh, beautiful service for the home going of Miss Hughes this morning at, at uh, 1030. And then there's probably uh, 40 people at David and Cheryl's house this afternoon. And some of you braved the rain. Uh, now then, Shan and Lanita, they waited till the rain stopped. Right? <laughs> Nora got there about the time it was pouring down at the house there. But uh, they are very, very thankful 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 for uh, our love and support of our church family and again thank you to each one of you and those that may be at home online that provided provided food today as well thank you thank you so much david and cheryl and, and their extended family are extremely uh, grateful um talked to donna this morning and donna putnam was supposed to see the doctor today and if all was going well Donna is supposed to go home tomorrow, and uh, uh, she, of course, she has two broken bones, one in her hip and one in her spine, and uh, she'll be on a walker at home probably for around uh, another four to six weeks before she'll be out and around. Of course, talking to Donna, it's on her left side, and she says, well, I really don't use that to drive, and well, Donna, maybe you may not need to be driving, okay, but continue to pray for Donna, and I pray that uh, she does get to go home tomorrow. Uh, the friend of ours, uh, Miss Patsy, uh, had, that has the blood disorder, uh, she is in the hospital now. Uh, her heart has been in AFib for uh, probably now five or six days, and they cannot get it back in uh, in rhythm. And um, she's having a reaction to the medication. So she covers uh, our prayers. So uh, Pat's, her name is Patsy Barnes. Rex? Did you? Bruce doing okay? All right. Well, I know he has good days and bad days, and hopefully we can see Bruce here again uh, soon at church. I uh, got a message from Donnie this afternoon, and he is has suffered some migraines, and he's in the midst of a bad one, and uh, wants to let everybody know that uh, that's why he's not here tonight, and he covets prayers for... Uh, being relieved of some of that pain. Uh, so that's why Donnie's not here tonight. Thank you for praying for Karen Gurley. That is Lori Williams' sister. She did get relatively good news for somebody who's being diagnosed with breast cancer. She got good news last Friday and that it's been in the early stages. Uh, the procedure will be minimally invasive and they don't think that they'll have to do chemo. So that is an answer to prayer and thank you for praying for Lori's sister. Uh, her husband, Trey Gurley, that has um, a stage four lung cancer, the seizure that he had last week that lasted for 35 minutes was related to tumors that have now spread to his brain, and there's not much that they can do for him. Uh, Cindy, any update on Alvin? We'll add Rick Smith to the prayer list, okay? And related to that, by the way, I don't know that we even told you about this, but Cheryl <coughs> uh, saw her cardiologist, and uh, she was having issues that if she got up and got around, her heart rate would accelerate and get up to 140, 150, and that type of thing. 
And so I card saw a cardiologist, and she has post-COVID restricted airways, <laughs> which uh, she didn't, I've never heard of that one before. But anyway, uh, they, they're they using her nebula, uh, not nebulizer, her inhaler. inhaler. And it's breaking that up, and her blood pressure is normal, and uh, her heart is not accelerating. So the doctor said that they're seeing a lot of this. She'll have to wear a heart monitor for a while, but it seems seem to be going well. But uh, that's a new side effect of COVID that I had not heard. But post-COVID restricted airways, but she's doing well. I talked to Linda Hood. Linda continues to make progress. She sounds good, uh, but they're still, I think, having issues regulating her medication, and uh, they will not let her drive. So that's the update that I have on Linda. All right, that's all that I have. Any updates that you might have or any additions or any praise that you want to share with us? Judges. Yes, ma'am. That's Susan, your cousin. Susan, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. He grew up in Houston. How much he had told me. Okay. So. On May the 6th? On May the 6th. Okay. And in Pensacola, Florida, right? Uh -huh. All right. And our youngest grandson, who is 16 in July, had scoliosis for a month. He's been going to the chiropractor for years. And the chiropractor, they're moving right now. We'll, we'll forgive him for that, but okay. family issues and that's all we yeah. need to know yeah. okay all right will do anyone else pat i have not heard of anything pastor National Day of Prayer, May 6th. Okay? Anyone else? Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you tonight thanking you for the, the blessing of rain today. And Father, the, the um, fresh air. Uh, Father, for the green grass. Uh, Father, thank you so much. Father, we thank you for our church family. We thank you, Father, for the way they respond to our church family when there is a need father we say thank you to each and every one that uh, helped with the food for the roberts family and father be with david and cheryl in this transition period and and in their physical home and father and, and in their family life as well and father we have there are many family members that are traveling and pray that you'd be with them as they're headed home that they'll have traveling grace and mercy and safety on the way back home but, Father, thank you for the, the testimony of, of Vera Hughes. And, uh, Father, just be with them in a special way. Father, we pray for Patsy Barnes and that uh, they'll be able to control her medication and take care of her heart issues as well. 
Father, we just pray that Donna will be able to go home tomorrow, that she'll get, she got a good report from her doctor today and for her healing. And Father, we just pray that we'll be able to see her back in church soon. Father, we pray for Karen Gurley, that uh, the procedure will, uh, the doctors perform will take care of the, her issue with the, her cancer. We pray for her husband as he's dealing with lung cancer. Father, we pray for the Rogers family and the Smith family as they're dealing with COVID. And then, Father, for Linda, we miss her at church here. We thank you for her great spirit and just pray that the doctors be able to regulate her medication. And then, Father, we pray for Susan. We pray for Shan's cousin there, Father, that will be having that procedure on May the 6th. That We pray for healing in her life. And for their grandson, Father, as they're seeing a surgeon and, and doctors on how to handle the scoliosis. And Father, again, we pray for the family issues there in the Longley family that, Father, that you would intervene and that there would be reconciliation, Father, and there, there would be peace and agreement and love uh, within that family. Father, we thank you for Plainview Baptist Church. We look forward to this coming Lord's Day. Uh, it'll be a great day here in, at Plainview. And Father, we're thinking ahead about Mother's Day and how that we might celebrate mothers and cherish them and and think back and reflect over what they meant to us. And Father, we thank you for godly mothers. And, and, and our country needs godly mothers now raising their children and being a heritage to their families. And then, Father, we thank you for Brother Tim and his family. What a blessing they are to our church. Thank you, Father, for them. Be with him as he speaks to us tonight and teaches and be with him, Father, as you give him a vision for what this church can be in this community. Father, again, we thank you for your blessings and just ask you to forgive us where we come, have come short. And, uh, Father, just uh, that bless the ministry that this church has, this community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And I will absolutely concur with what David said about Miss Vera's service today. Uh, Many times I attend funerals or have conducted funerals, and usually the older the person is who passes away, the fewer there are in the congregation. And that was certainly not the case for Miss Vera. It was a tremendous turnout of people, uh, bad weather and all, and there were just as many young people as seniors. It was just a well-balanced crowd of people. Her life was truly a, a rich heritage of her faithfulness. And I was really impressed that she was involved with the Salvation Army. William Booth, who was the founder of Salvation Army, is one of my big heroes of the faith. And I uh, always enjoy reading stories and uh, documentaries about his life because William Booth was a tremendous man of God. And he left a great legacy there of helping the poor. Uh, we're going to look in Psalm 26 tonight. And Psalm 26 is one of those hymns and psalms that is a very direct uh, challenging psalm for all of us but it's also one where David is very confident in his faith and in his strength and his relationship with God the key word that you're going to see uh, in this particular psalm is the word integrity integrity is the key Am I spelling this correctly? Miss Beverly will help me. Yeah. Oh, I got my E and my R switched, don't I? No? No, there's just no R. Yeah. And, and, well, I'm thinking of the word integer. So that's where integrity, gritty, integrity. And that's where we get the word integer which is a whole number. There's no fraction. And the key to this whole psalm is the word integrity. And it's going to give David a tremendous amount of confidence. Uh, one of the things I always tell young people uh, in, in their teenage years especially is that purity is power. And if you keep your purity, it gives you power because what it is it's an expression of a person's personal integrity. And so whenever I'm dealing with teenagers and uh, in my youth ministry, I would always reinforce the idea that purity is power. 
Now, Jesus Christ can restore your purity through your personal relationship with Christ. But when young people are living their lives, they want to live a life and strive for purity because it gives them personal integrity, integrity in their personal life. And so integrity always deals with the truth. It's always involving the truth. And so what we see here is the whole truth. Just like we have the word uh, integer for whole numbers, integrity is about the whole truth and nothing but the truth. That's what they tell you to say when you take your oath and go into the courtroom. So it's the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So it's not fractional. And one of the problems with gossip, and that's why it's listed as one of the terrible sins. I mean, it'll put you in hell. People think, well, you know, I was just, you know, sharing something, you know. Uh, and, and sometimes you hear that prayer request years ago. Well, I won't mention any names, but, and then by the time they're done, you're like, well, I know who that is. That's the person across the room. So we don't want to gossip. Gossip is murder because what it is, it's a half-truth, and a half-truth is always a lie. See, a half-truth is always a lie. So whole truth is what we deal with, and that's what we see in David. Look, just look at this. Let's just do an overview of Psalm 26. Um, six times you hear, or, yeah, five times you hear David say this, okay? I have walked in integrity. I have trusted in the Lord. I have walked in your truth. I have hated the assembly of evildoers. I have not sat with idolaters. And I have loved the habitation of your house. That's a confident statement. What he's saying is, looking back on my life, the foundation of my life, I have done these things. I've walked, I've trusted, I've rejected or hated the evil, and I've loved your house. And then... And the other aspect of this, there's, a, there's both the positive and the negative. Here's what he says. He says, in the future tense, past tense, he said those things. Future tense, this is what he's saying. And he is basing this on his personal spiritual integrity with God. He says, I will not go with hypocrites. I will not go in with hypocrites. I will not sit with the wicked. I will wash my hands in innocence. I will walk in my integrity. I will bless the Lord. So we see in this psalm that his integrity, his spiritual integrity, that means the whole truth. He's honest with God. And that's one of the keys that we get out of the psalms with David. Be honest with God. And sometimes we have a problem with self-deception. Sometimes we deceive ourselves into believing something about ourselves that isn't true. Just watch American Idol. And when they have the rehearsals, you know, when they have the, the um, people who try out, and they say, oh, I'm a great singer, and they can't sing. Uh, a chicken can do better than they, you know. And so they, but they've convinced themselves they're going to be this worldwide great singer, and they're not. They don't have the skills, they don't have the gifts, but it's self-deception. What David is revealing to us in this, in this psalm that he is not a person who is giving himself self-deception, okay? So he's being very honest, he's being very straightforward, he's being forthright. So let's take a look, let's break this down, and let's take a look at this psalm. He says, vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. See, there's a confidential statement, a confident statement right there. I have walked in my integrity. That's past tense. I have also trusted in the Lord. And as a result of that, here's what he's saying. I will not slip. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my mind and my heart, for your loving kindness is before my eyes. I have walked in your truth. I have not sat with idolatrous mortals, nor will I go in with the hypocrites. I have hated the assembly of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. So in those first five verses... These are strong words that he's saying. He's telling the Lord, I want you to examine me. I want you to look into my heart and prove that I'm telling you the truth. Prove and see if this is true about myself. This is a very confident, faithful person. He is a man who is, David is a man who is living his faith 
with integrity. That's what we want. We want to live our lives with integrity. So here's what he says with judge or vindicate. Vindicate me, O Lord, or it says in the King, uh, original King James, it says judge me, which means to vindicate or to clear blame. Clear me of any blame. So vindication is to prove me right and to clear me of any wrongdoing. And then the inter, 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 integrity is what we mentioned a moment ago, which gives us the word integer. That's a whole number, not a fraction. So he's saying that his faith, his, his life before the Lord, there's no fractions. There's no division of the truth. It's the whole truth that he's living out. He's striving to live the law of the Lord and to live with integrity, both in his personal life and his public life. The difference between the self-righteous and the righteous is this, that the self-righteous, the self-righteous, their, their faith is only on public display. Okay? Their faith is public display, whereas the righteous, they are what they are both publicly and privately. And that's the difference. The self-righteous, they're one thing in private. They're something else in public. And that's not, in, that's not integrity. That's half a truth. They're only being, and actually it's a, it's a whole truth in the sense that they're liars. Because what you are, if you, if you live one life in church, but you become something else when you walk out the door, then you're really living a lie. Jesus Christ in, intends for our faith to transform our lives personally, privately, as well as publicly. And, the, and really, the person who's living their faith privately has a much more profound effect in the public, even if they don't say anything, because they're walking with integrity. I've had friends who live a strong Christian life. They, they, str they strive to live their faith very strongly. And they've been given opportunities for promotion in places, companies. And then they're told after they get the job, oh, by the way, we need you to fudge these numbers. Or we need you to overlook this. And they're like, no, I can't do that. I, I'm not going to do that. You've put me in a position between the truth and, and, and not a truth. And they know that they're going to be the scapegoat if it gets caught. So they just step down. They said, well, you can give it to somebody else. I don't want the job. And I had one friend who had really, he had an incredible opportunity to uh, go up in a company. And he said, I saw how the office was being run and I wasn't going to be a part of it. So he says, judge me, Lord. That is, clear me of blame. And he says, and I have trusted in the Lord. That is, I put my confidence or my faith in the Lord. And the word, remember, trust is the best word we have in English to express faith. So anytime you're thinking about the word trust, it means faith. And then he says, I shall not slip. And the word slip there means to waver or totter. I'm not going to waver or totter. When we do mountain climbs, sometimes you get up in the ice and you, you can feel your feet trying to slide. So what you have with these, what they call crampons, you put spikes on the bottom of your boots and you, you get a, like, they're like teeth sticking into the ice. And even then, sometimes it, it's kind of a scary thing. But you're walking on it, but it gives you a grip. You're not going to slide so readily. And it's like having these teeth in his, in his um, sandals. He's going, I'm not going to slip. I'm not going to totter. I'm not going to waver. I'm, I'm true with what I believe. Then he says, examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Now, this word examine is a great word. As I was doing a study on this thing, on this, on this psalm, there's a tremendously interesting thing with a word meaning here in the Hebrew when it says examine. Usually we think of like uh, examine would be almost like a microscope, a deep, in-depth look, or a telescope looking out into the distance to see the distance. But this word examine is an interesting Hebrew word. It means a testing or a purification of metal. Purification. We're just going to pretend that's what that says. 
But this is what it means. To examine here is a, purific it's a purifying of gold. And it's also the idea of testing it to its breaking point. Uh, my son's a civil engineer, and, and uh, my cousin's son is a civil engineer. And my cousin's son invented this really interesting machine when he was in college. And it was a really cool thing that he came up with. And it was a testing of concrete and rebarb and how much stress it could take before it would break. And they came up with this new concept. And it was amazing how it would test it. And certain rebarb created in a certain type of iron is going to last longer than another and so forth. It's all about the ingredients in the metal. Well, the pure gold has very little what they call dross, which is the imp imperfections that come up. When you heat the gold or silver, it comes up to the top. They would scrape off the top. And that's why if you buy gold and you want real pure fine gold, it'll say it's 99.999% gold or whatever. And so it has absolutely almost nothing of impure, uh, impurities in it. Well, here, because of his integrity, because he lives a life fully dedicated to the whole truth, and he's striving to live out the law of God, his commandments, and he's seeking to be truthful in his relationships, truthful with himself. He's, uh, he's being everything he can be with undivided truth. He's saying to the Lord, you can examine me like gold. Put me in the heat and prove me. Bring it to the top and let's see if there's anything in me that has any kind of problems. Things that need to be scraped out, removed from my life. You can examine me. Heat, heat up this metal, Lord. I want to be pure gold for you is what he's saying. He's saying, I want to be pure gold for you. And there's a word uh, in the Hebrew it's called assay. A-S-S-A-Y. But it's pronounced I say. And this is just that. It's a purification. And that's what that word prove means. It's a pure purifying of gold and precious metals. So the word prove is I, I say, which is a purifying of gold or precious metals. So he says, prove me, purify me, make me, make me more. Then he says, try my mind and my heart. Now, the word try there is to look into the reins of my mind and my heart. So when you look at the idea of try, it's reins. Now, it's not like pulling the reins on a horse, but actually in this Hebrew language, it means the choice part or the seat of the emotions or affections. What he's saying is he says, try my mind and my heart, he's saying the the deepest part of my inner self tested my mind and my heart. He's looking at his mind and his heart. And when you think about your life, isn't that true? I mean, um, the mind and the heart are really what make you what you are. We have the mind, the will, and the emotions. And so the word, of course, heart includes all that. So... We have a mind, a will, and emotions, and the heart is the center piece of that. It's the central part. And the Hebrew concept is that it's all tied to the heart, which refers to all three aspects of us, mind, will, and emotions. If you get any one of these out of, out of whack, then the others go down too. Okay? Now, sometimes you'll say, my mind's telling me this, but my heart's telling me this. Okay, so there's a conflict of truth there. And Jesus said, you better be careful what your heart's telling you because it can deceive you. Now, when he says heart, in the gospel there, he's referring to the emotion. He's not talking about the mind, will, and the emotion. He says, don't trust your heart. What he's saying there, Jesus is saying, don't trust your emotions because your emotions can change. I mean, emotions can be like a thermostat. Sometimes people's emotions get good when they have their happy meal, you know, their comfort food. That's why they have comfort food, right? Ice cream, I'm feeling down, I need some ice cream. You know, that's what some people do. And then what? You get a sugar rush, whatever, then it affects your mind, your will. Well, you, what whole truth does, integrity does, it aligns all three of these together. And so your emotions, there's a, there's a time to have strong emotions about things. 
I mean, even Jesus got angry, and he chased twice. He chased him out of the temple with a whip because he said, you, you're violating the integrity of my father's house. You've turned it into a place of c commerce. I, that's not what this is about. This is about a house of prayer, and he went after them because they were, they were just making a profit off the name of God. How much of that you see today? When I go into a Christian bookstore today, I just walk past all the trinkets and stuff, and I go back into where they got the study books and the, and the, con, uh, the different commentaries and concordances and Bibles. And that's where I go. This business of, you know, a ruler that says, do you measure up to Jesus' standard? You know, don't be a yo-yo for the Lord. I mean, all this stuff, he erases our sins, you know, with erasers. You know, but that's not what Jesus died for. Now, that's fine. You want to give that to a child. But, you know, if you're 45 years old, you're like, i got to have my Jesus eraser, there's a problem. Because we should be moving from the milk to the meat. And what he's taking us to is this deep, deep spiritual things. So he's saying, prove me. Now, then he says, try my mind, that is test it, and, and bring it about. Then he says, for your loving kindness. Now, here's where we get the reason. Is because he says, for your loving kindness is before my eyes. Okay? So the reason he's saying, vindicate me. I've walked in your integrity. I've trusted in you. I will not slip. I will not fall. I will not totter. I will not lose my step. And then he says, you, you, you take a look at me. You test me like fine metal. Test me and see what kind of metal I'm made of. And try my mind and my heart. That means go into the depths of my inner being, my mind and my will and emotions. Because, you know, for your loving kindness is ever before me. Loving kindness means the favors and benefits that come from following God. So he's saying that it's got benefits. There's benefit in following the Lord. And he says it's before my eyes, which means it's in the forefront of his thoughts. Okay? And here's what we have to work on in our personal lives as Christian people. We have to keep in our mind, instead of our circumstances, we have to think in our minds, ever before us, the benefit of being a Christian. That's the important component of walking in faith and having a faith that has integrity, whole truth in it. And that's what David's talking about in this psalm. In this psalm, Psalm 26, he's saying, look at me, you can examine me, test me, I'm walking in your truth. I've walked in your truth, past tense, he says. But he says, your loving kindness is before my eyes. And the word before means always or ever before. So it's an always and ever before. Ever before my eyes is what he's saying here. It's in the forefront of my thoughts. Forefronts of my thoughts all the time. So regardless, and you got to remember, this guy's a king. He's got armies trying to destroy him. He had a rebellious son, Absalom, who tried to undermine him. He had another king prior to him, King Saul, trying to kill him and plotting to kill him and using his soldiers to hunt him down. And he's having to hide in caves and everything else. He's been delivered from all of that. We looked at that psalm, how he'd been rescued and delivered from all of that. And he's able now to walk in the freedom of, of the other side of those challenging moments. And now he's saying, I'm still keeping in my mind, ever before me, your loving kindness, the benefit and riches of you. And it comes from a root word, and we've discussed this before, it comes from a root word where it implies the idea that God bends down, reaches down to David, and blesses him. That's what the imagery is there. So the, 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 the term of kindness, as part of loving and kindness, the word kindness means a bowing down or a reaching down where God's coming down as if he were physically coming out of heaven to reach down to his servant David to bless him. That's what the imagery there is. So we see this theme again being reinforced. And it's important for us when we pray that when we pray, we don't think of Jesus as way up somewhere in the sky, out in space somewhere, but that he's actually 
very much right with us. That's what the Holy Spirit's role is. And Jesus said the Holy Spirit will utter words on your behalf that you don't even know what to say. So he's praying on your behalf. If you ever have a very difficult moment in your life, a personal crisis or a situation concerning your health and you don't know what to pray and your emotions cause you just to feel this groaning and emptiness and you have this almost like, I don't know where God even is in this. That's when the Holy Spirit steps in and prays on your behalf. And he's praying things for you that you don't even know. So, and you can say that. Oh, Holy Spirit, speak for me. I don't know what to say, but speak to the Father and tell him what's going on here. And it's important for us to have that idea in our heads and in our hearts. that this is, And that's part of the integrity of his faith. He's believing what he cannot see. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of unseen things. And the Bible also says in Hebrews, we are to walk by faith and not by sight. Or that's in 1 Corinthians. We walk by faith and not by sight. So our faith is one of trusting in things we cannot see, but we believe is reality. And he says, I've walked in your truth. And that is in a, as a manner of life. The word walk means it's a manner of life. It's the way I live my life. It's a lifestyle. When he says, I walk in your truth, it's a lifestyle. This is part of who I am. And his truth means a firm stability, a reliability. So this idea of it, integrity, and we think of the whole truth, now we're looking at truth, and this is his reliability. Reliability. So God, we have a reliability in God. We can trust him. He's true to his word. His whole truth is truth. Jesus is the truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. You see, here we get evidence of Jesus Christ right here is the word truth. So in order to relate to Jesus Christ in, in the form of truth, living truth, then we have to live a life of integrity. We have to have a life that is whole with the truth. And that's what Jesus Christ comes to put in our lives. When we give our lives to Jesus Christ, we're, we're fractured. It's like we're cracked. we got all these different cracks in us. Or we got pieces missing. And he puts it all back together. He puts a wholeness back to our lives. And so we face the truth with integrity. We face the whole truth. And when we're dealing with truth, we understand his reliability. Uh, Billy Graham said one time, he said, it, he said, I think the biggest regret that Christian people will have when they go to heaven is that they didn't, they didn't pray enough. It's the things they should have prayed for they never thought about, that they didn't pray for. He said, I think that's where we're going to realize the things we could have asked God, but we didn't have either the faith or the conviction or the understanding to ask for those things. And we're afraid a lot of times to pray very specific prayers. Most prayers are general. Uh, we should be praying more specific prayers and praying with faith. Why? Because he's reliable. We can trust him. His truth is undivided. There's no fraction of truth in God or Jesus Christ. It is solid. It's total. It's everything. And then he says, I've not sat with the idolatrous mortals. And here we see the integrity uh, in his relationship with people look what it says there i've not sat that means i've not remained or dwelled or married that word in the hebrew can is is more of a stronger term it means like a married relationship and he's referring to not just marriage between husband and wife but he's talking about a connection with a group where you've made vows with a group that are not christian are not believers, are not faithful. And there's a lot of people get involved in all kinds of organizations. Be careful where you put your vows. And some of them will determine, uh, will demand that you put them ahead of your family and everything else. So he's saying, I've not made any kind of vows. I've not married into any kind of group. And that's what that word means there when he says sat. I've not married, that's the deeper meaning of it. I've not joined my soul with an organization or a group of people 
And it says, and the vain is the word that's used there, which means an, an empty or false or lying. It's the same idea of using the Lord's name in vain. So when it talks about idolatrous mortals, it says in the um, New King James, but it talks about with vain people or vain mortals. That word vain is the same word where it says do not use the Lord's name in vain. That means in a profane way, but it can also mean in an empty fashion. Uh, using God's name is a curse word, and you hear people do this with Jesus Christ. They, use it, they used to use his name with a disdain. Um, that shows their depravity. It shows uh, their reprobate mind, and that's what it is. It's a reflection of a reprobate mind. That is a mind that's depraved. It doesn't have the knowledge of God in the, in a sense of of repentance. It has a knowledge of God with an attitude of rebellion. And so he's saying here the same word uh, that they're not using vain. That means vanity. That means empty ways, and it's the same word as using God's name in vain, in an empty way. But there are people that you'll also hear uh, that they'll just say things out of habit. You know, well, praise the Lord. Well, do they really mean that, or are they just saying that? Is that a van that's, That can be using God's name in vain as well. So we don't just throw the name of the Lord around as a cliche or a bumper sticker he, he, he deserves our reverence and, and our honor that's due him and our worship. And he says, and I'll not go in with hypocrites. And, of course, we know what the word hypocrite means. It means an actor. You remember the, the two faces in acting, the smiling? and That's a hypocrite. They're one thing in one scene, and there's something else in another scene, and it comes back to that same idea of coming into his presence with integrity. Hypocrites have no integrity. They're not people who show any reflection of any integrity. And this idea of the vanity, by the way, is like a, a roar of water. It comes from two words. It means a roar of water and a worthlessness is what that word vanity means there. So these hypocrites, they roar with empty, vain things that have no meaning. They're empty. That's what hypocrites do. And he says, and I've hated the assembly of evildoers. And these are people who are breaking up. They profess one belief, but their opinions and opinions, but they don't, they don't really live them. So the word here of, of these hypocrites and assembly, that word assembly is an interesting word because it, it doesn't mean just a gathering of people. It's a type of people. This assembly is a type of people. They're dissemblers. They're referred to as dissemblers, actually. It translates in the English from Hebrew as dissemblers. What's a dissembler? This is what they are. They profess beliefs and opinions that they really do not hold to conceal their true belief. Now, how many times have we met people like that? They'll tell you one thing to your face, but they walk out the door and they got a whole different opinion. Yeah, I've... You see that all the time. That's a form of hypocrisy. And he's saying these dissemblers of evildoers. He refers to them as evildoers. They're telling you one thing to your face. They're doing something else behind your back. They actually believe something else behind your back. That's what he's calling out here. God is serious about us living the truth. And it's sobering. And Jesus says there's not a single thought or word you have that's not being recorded. Every word will be given into account. That is a sobering thought. And it's the kind of thing that keeps me up at night. I get to think about stuff, roll around and say, well, you know, Lord, years ago I said this. I shouldn't have said it. Like, I mean, it comes to mind. So, th but that's a good thing. You confess your sins to the Lord and ask him to forgive you of your sins. That's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. So when he brings those things to your mind and then you say, Lord, thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your forgiveness. So this is a gathering of people together who are dissemblers. And they're one thing in the, in, the, in the congregation or in public, but then there's something else behind your back or in private. 
And he says, and I will not sit with the wicked. That is, I will not dwell with the morally and ethically wrong, the guilty of spiritual crimes. These are people who are guilty of spiritual crimes. So let's go finish this thing up. I will wash my hands in innocence. I will wash my hands in innocence. Who said that? Pilate said that. Yeah, remember? Pilate said, I'm going to wash my hands of this. I can't find any fault in this man you want me to crucify. And he went publicly and he got a basin of water and washed his hands and he held his hands up and he said, I'm innocent of this man's blood. You see to it. But the truth is he was just as guilty as the mob because he gave them what they wanted. Had he stood for the whole truth, had Pilate had integrity, he'd say, we're not going to crucify this man today. You're going to have to prove to me why we need to crucify him. I need proof why he needs to be crucified. He didn't do that. He didn't hold to the whole truth. He gave in to the mob. What do we see in our country today? Same thing. People are giving in to the pressures of the mob. What they want. And as I told you, Sorian Kierkegaard, the Christian philosopher, said, the crowd is untruth. The crowd is untruth. You cannot believe the truth. Look at the mob that wanted to stone the, the woman caught in adultery. And what did Jesus do? He's, he, he's the only one who can defuse a mob. You can't control a mob. You can, you can surround them by the military, the police, but they are in, they are, you cannot reason with evildoers. When they're bent on something and they have something they want to do, you can't reason with them. That's what happened in Sodom. When the, when the angels came and they came to the door and they said, Lot, where are those men? We want them. They were going to rape those angels. That's what their intentions were. They were, they were vile and violent. And he said, no, you can't have them. Here's my two virgin daughters. You can have them. And then what happened? They said, we're going to do worse to you than them if you don't let us have them. That was an evil mob. And it took the angels to blind them. And even then they were so bought and caught up in their evil that they were groping around in the darkness trying to find the handle to the door to get in. That's how... In just completely engulfed they were in their depravity. Well, Jesus is the only one that ever defused a mob. There was a mob that was going to stone this woman to death, and they said, we caught her in the very act of adultery. My question is, where's the man? Just the woman. And my other question is, what were they doing? They had been looking in the window. It was a setup. But they were going to use her to try to trick Jesus and Jesus diffused the whole thing by confronting them, what? With the whole truth. Because what did he say to them? Okay, you without sin, you cast the first stone. And he said he began to write on the sand. Some think, people think he wrote the Ten Commandments. Some people think he thought he wrote specific sins that those men had done. But whatever he was writing in the sand, it said they all began to drop their rocks and walk away. And he's the only person we have on record who could defuse an entire mob because nobody else can do that. But why? Because he confronted them with the whole truth, the, a, a truth of, with integrity. There is no other kind. There is no other such thing as truth except truth that has integrity. And he says, I wash my hands in innocence. Pilate couldn't do it because he gave in to the mob. He didn't have the ability, but the, the idea of washing goes way back you had Naaman in 2 Kings 5.14. He was told to wash in the River Jordan, and he was clean of his leprosy. Jesus washed the feet. We talked about that. There's an idea of, of and a concept of cleansing. The physical washing is a representation of the spiritual condition. And what he says is, I will wash my hands in innocence. Well, there's only one source of innocence for us that we can be washed in. And that is the blood of Jesus. It's his blood that washes us in innocence. The baptism doesn't wash you of innocence. The baptism is a representation of everything that happened to you. It's simply a symbolic statement that says, I was buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in new life. I was, I was resurrected by the power of Christ. The water also represents the flood or the baptism of blood. That you've been covered in the blood of Christ. You've been completely covered in him. And he makes you white as snow. He washes you. So the only way that we have innocence for our hands 
is in Christ Jesus. Now this word hands has, has, this is interesting, but in the Hebrew, it actually means both your hands and your feet. And so when Jesus was washing the feet of his disciples, that's, this, that's again a reflection of a servant serving people, but your hands and your feet are two expressions of what you do. Your mouth is the other one. What we say, what we do with our hands, and what we do, and where we go with our feet, is is basically the testimony of our lives. Because whatever we're saying, whatever we're doing with our hands, and wherever our feet are taking us, reflect who we are. And if we're living a life of integrity, then we have the grace of God to give us clean hands and clean feet and clean words to say and do what we should be doing. And He says, "I wash them in." innocence then he says i will go about your altar O lord now he's talking about the integrity of his worship that i may proclaim the voice of thanksgiving and tell all your wondrous works lord i've loved the inhabit the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells now david did a wonderful thing tonight when he was praying and i don't know how many of you caught it but when he was praying it was a prayer of thanksgiving he prayed a lot of thanksgiving tonight. There were requests, but it was mixed with what? Thanksgiving. Because thanksgiving gives us the right attitude as we enter into prayer. Because thanksgiving first recognizes, we, it, it creates in us a humble spirit because it says, you've already benefited us so much. Now when I come before you with a prayer request, I want to let you know, Lord, I appreciate what you've already done. And if you answer this, answer this prayer accordingly to what I would like, thank you. If you don't, thank you because you've already benefited me so much. That's where he comes back to that, the idea of for your loving kindness is before my eyes in verse 2. Now we see the voice of thanksgiving. So we see in his eyes he sees the benefits of following the Lord and now, with his voice, he's telling others, he's proclaiming the benefits that have been already bestowed. So we're blessed. And he says, and I'll tell all your wondrous works. That is, things only you can do, Lord. And look what he says, past tense. I have loved the habitation of your house. Don't you love coming to church? I can't imagine people without church. It's great. It's wonderful. And so when I come in here and we see... We, sometimes we have new faces in here. Sometimes we have lots of familiar faces in here. But there's something about coming into the house of the Lord. And you know, I haven't been here that long, but I feel at home. I've heard many of your names out there. The Shiflet name, we heard that as soon as we moved into town. That's a name that we knew. And then my son started going to school with one of her grandsons, and that's a name we know. So when we walk in the door... Oh, well, I know that name. So there's a connection. But we all know each other because of what? Jesus. We're brothers and sisters in the Lord. And so it's a beautiful thing to come into the house of the Lord. Occasionally I go into a house of worship, a church, and I'm telling you it's like a funeral home in a bad way. They're having a funeral service for Jesus every Sunday and not a celebration of an empty tomb. And that's what Christ is. He is a representation of life. He's brought us forth. He's brought us back to life. So being in church is a good thing. It's a, it's a home. It's a place where we come and celebrate. And that's what he's saying. He says, I loved the habitation of your house, which means I absolutely adored it. I can't get enough of it. I need to be in the house of God. He says, and the place where your glory dwells. So there are places where God's glory dwells. Not always everywhere. The glory of God is not made known by emotion, but it's made known by worship. And emotional worship is not always a reflection of the glory of God. You can go to a big praise rally, but the glory of God is not really there. It's focused on something else. It's focused on the band or the music or the whatever. But what he's saying here is, is that your glory dwells. That means it's there all the time. It's, it's, it's constant. It sits down upon that house of worship. So we're blessed to be here. And then he says, do not gather my soul with sinners. Now we're going to look at the integrity that he has with the world. 
Do not gather my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody, bloodthirsty men, in whose hands is a sinister scheme, and whose right hand is full of bribes. Now here's a reflection of where we are as a nation today. There's no doubt about this. We have a nation now that celebrates sinners. That is, people who violate or go against the will of God. They lack integrity of the truth. One of the things that's one of our greatest challenges today as a nation is we're not getting the whole truth any longer. There was a time when you could turn on the news and you say, well, I, you know, I know this guy's got a certain opinion or he's got a certain commentary on a certain idea. Uh, he's against this or he's for that. You could kind of filter that out. Now, they just don't tell you anything. It's just they tell you one headline, and even that's misleading. And it's not just secular news. I'm finding in some Christian news circles as well. I subscribe to all kinds of different Christian news circuits, and some of them are, it's just, it's just there's no whole truth to it. They only tell you what they want you to know. So the whole truth, and who can trust this? No one. And so our, soul, our nation is, is always had sinners, but now we have sinners that are so deep in sin that they no longer understand what the truth even is. They distort it. Now they just outright tell us lies. And this is just going on further and further. And, and what they're trying to do is convince everybody of these lies. And you see a lot of people tuning out. Then he says also, my, my life is not with bloodthirsty men. And that means people who have violent cravings. And again, this comes from the concept of an idea of an animalistic mindset. Just like we mentioned a minute ago about Sodom. There's an animalistic mindset. And then, in whose hands is a sinister scheme? That is, they're scheming. They're always planning something, and it's sinister. It's not good. It's not honest. And the reason it's not honest is because they're not dealing with integrity. They're not dealing with the whole truth. They're scheming things, and they'll take a bribe. How many of us have seen that? He judges a bribe. These people are getting free, getting set off, getting set free. Well, look what happened when, when the virus first started. People forget this. They opened up the prisons and let no telling how many people out. Especially up in New York, Manhattan, they turned those people loose. Well, they're on the streets, and now they're causing chaos. And it's like saying, okay, now you go back and try to fetch them and bring them back in. And now they've tied the hands of the police. So it's kind of like you had a bunch of chickens in a chicken house, and then somebody opened the door, let them out, and then they want somebody else to go out and try to gather them back up, and they're scattered all over the place. You can't get them back in. Well, there's, there's these bloodthirsty people out there, and there's also fewer and less uh, consequences of their bloodthirstiness. And so he says they have sinister schemes. There's schemes going on in this country right now. You better believe it. They'll tell you you're conspir conspiratory, that you believe in conspiracy theories, has nothing to do with conspiracies. It has to do with the truth, the whole truth. And there's a lot of people who will tell you, well, you're just a cons you know, conspiracy guy. No, I'm looking at it in the lens of whole truth. And the whole truth says you're telling me lies. And if you're telling me lies, you're covering up something. You've got some other agenda. And people are being bribed all the time. That is, got their hand out, taking money. And then finally, this last thing, he says, but as for me. Okay, so at the beginning... He says, you can judge me, you can look at me, you can vindicate me. He says, but as for me, this is his benediction. I will walk in my integrity. So it starts with integrity and it ends with integrity. He says, I have walked and I will walk. So he says, I have walked and he says, I will walk. Why does he say that? Because of everything he just told us. He's seen the benefits, the loving kindness of the Lord, and he says, so I have walked, and I will walk. I will stay on the path I'm on, because it's good to live like this. Being honest and truthful with God is a good thing. I'm going to live with my integrity, the whole truth. I'm living with the whole truth. I'm walking in, in my integrity, he says. It's mine. And that's one thing about integrity. Integrity is something that is yours. You own it. And how, in, how honest you are with yourself, with others, with God, is all rest on each individual. There is a standard of truth.
There's a standard of wholeness of truth. That's, you don't get to make your own truth. Truth is truth. We don't get to do that. But we own it, what we do with it. So when we have the truth and it's been revealed to us, what we do with the truth determines what we become. And when we've been told the truth, then it's up to us to live it out. And then he says, redeem me and be merciful to me. The word redemption is just that. It means to take and repair or make new, redeem me. That is, pay my ransom is what this word redeem means. Pay my ransom and be merciful to me. So he says, even in my integrity, I've got, I've got a price on my head. I'm still a spiritual crim- criminal. So ransom has to be paid, and we know where the ransom was paid at Calvary. Jesus Christ, he pardons our sin. Our ransom was paid, and we hear this in our hymns all the time. The word pardon is mentioned in several hymns. The word ransom is mentioned in several hymns, especially songs that have to do with the cross because that's a recurring theme. There's a ransom. There's a price to be paid for our sin, and someone had to pay the price. Christ did that. He redeems us, and he's merciful to us, which means, again, the same thing with loving kindness. He stoops down to help us. What did God do? He sent his son here. He came down to be among us. He actually left his place in heaven to walk among us. Why? To redeem us, to pay the ransom, to pay off the ransom, a debt that we could not pay, a debt we owe but was too much for us and too great for us to pay. And he says, and again, you look at this, it goes back to verse 1, verse 12, goes back to verse 1 he says my foot stands in an even place so he says I shall not slip in verse 1 he closes off with my foot stands in an even place that means it's a smooth place it endures on a level straight place and that word stands means to endure so my foot has an enduring place an enduring spot a place that's safe and a place that's trustworthy. It's a, it's, a, it's a spot that you can put your foot on and you don't have to worry about slipping and falling. You will not teeter or totter and fall off. And then finally, the last thing is this. In the congregations, I will bless the Lord. In the congregations. Now that's interesting. He has a plural there. And here's why. So the congregations is plural. What kind of congregations he's talking about? Well, he's certainly talking about the congregation in the temple. But he's also talking about the congregations in the synagogues all over the countryside. And we see Jesus going both to the temple and then to the synagogues across the countryside. But there's one other. And it's the congregation in heaven. So he's saying there's, there's the earthly congregations that we're going to worship and serve and there's a heavenly one an eternal one so we have an earthly we have an earthly place an earthly home earthly worship house and we have an eternal one that's heaven and that's why it's so the precision of what David says in his psalms is incredible you cannot make this up it has to be spiritual it has to be the Holy Spirit that gave him the insight Because who else would put a plural except the Holy Spirit? He's telling us you have earthly synagogues, worship, churches, synagogues in David's day, churches for us. That's our earthly home while we abide here, but we have an eternal congregation waiting for us. So we'll be a part of it. And the word there also emphasizes the idea of a choir or a singing blessing congregation. The word bless there is the word that is connected with a choir. That is a singing or blessing of the Lord. So the congregations, I will be in the choir of the Lord. And we're all going to sing. And none of us are going to be off key. So so we see the integrity in David's heart. We see the integrity in his relationships. We see integrity in his worship. We see integrity as he relates to the world. And we see integrity that brings him to heaven. And that integrity for us is found in Christ.
Well, Father, thank you again for this evening, and we thank you for your word, and we thank you for David's wisdom, his insight, his gifts, his understanding, his knowledge, his just depths of understanding. Help us, Lord, to have that same kind of walk with you, that we'll have a confidence in our walk with you, and that you will enlighten our hearts, bring joy to our hearts and minds, and that we'll live with a wholeness of the truth. And with no division, help us, Lord, to strive for that, that you would test us the way you tested David. And where we are fought, find places that need correction, Lord, show us that correction. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Thank you all so much for being here tonight.